Hi, it's Tom here from Running Physio. Today, I want to talk to you about a less common injury, but one that you will see in clinic, which is calcaneal stress fractures. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how to spot them and some of the treatment options, investigations and things within this video. I've also put a link to our free videos that we've got available for you on Clinical Edge, uh, including videos on iliotibial band syndrome, Achilles tendinopathy, lateral hip pain, and lots more. So they're free, do check out the link if you want to get great results with runners that you see in clinic. Now what motivated me to cover this topic was actually seeing a couple of patients recently in clinic. Now I, I want to be honest about this, I don't see calcaneal stress fractures very often. Um, they're not something that uh, is filling up my list on a day-to-day -day basis. But bizarrely, I had two suspected cases, one after the other. And they, they were puzzled as to what the, the problem was. Um, they thought perhaps it might be an Achilles issue, but it wasn't really behaving like that. And I thought, this is an area I'd like to know more about. So I thought, I'd try and learn more about it and share what I'm learning with you. So I'm not coming from this and saying I'm an expert in this particular type of stress fracture, but I'm gonna share some of the information I've learned on my journey finding out a little bit more about this condition and how it's managed. Um, I'd also like to thank Susie Spears, who's been really good at answering my questions on this topic. She's fantastic, do follow her on Twitter. And there's a really good uh, paper recent review that I'll link to to on this by Italiano and Bitterman. So I'll put that in the comments later if you want to find out more about it. So let's talk a little bit about these uh, calcaneal stress fractures and how they present. Now, there are various um, different presentations for this, and this is true of stress fractures in general. They don't tend to all follow exactly the same pattern um, and the patients that I saw actually both of them had similar presentations so they had pain around about the Achilles insertion and uh, instead of it behaving like an a tendinopathy with early morning stiffness with a warm-up response where perhaps it might get better with activity and with pain on palpation of the Achilles itself it was much more tender when I felt around uh, the calcaneum itself just anterior to the Achilles insertion. So that bony tenderness was what kind of got my spidey senses tingling a little bit to think mm, this isn't really fitting at a, a tendinopathy issue. And they were quite irritable. They were causing these patients pain just with walking. And I would expect if you've got an, a tendon issue that's really that irritable, we'd have other signs and symptoms too, particularly things like early morning stiffness that wasn't present in either of these cases. So it's already sort of not quite fitting the usual common presentations that we might see. And whenever we have pain with weight bearing, with walking, with impact, there should be part of us that thinks of a stress fracture as a differential diagnosis. Now, when I've looked into the, the different types of uh, calcaneal stress fractures, um, I've done a little bit of amateur art here to try and show you. It does seem that you, you can get some uh, right down close uh, to, at the base of the heel, almost close to the insertion of the plantar fascia. So that might mimic plantar heel pain in terms of its pain location and behavior. Although again, plantar heel pain typically would have early morning stiffness, which we might not see present here. You can also get them a little bit more superiorly, um, as I suspect may be the case in these two people that I've seen recently the pain there on palpation just anterior to the Achilles tendon and you can get more uh, posterior stress fractures as well and we look at some of the the research here it suggests around about 56 percent are going to be more kind of posteriorly lo located uh, calcaneal stress fractures um, around about 18 percent are going to be more central uh, calcaneal stress fractures and about 26 percent are going to be more anterior calcaneal stress fractures so they do seem to vary in their location and their presentation to some degree. So if you have a patient with what you might think is an insertion of Achilles tendinopathy or plantar fasciopathy, or they've just got some heel pain that isn't really behaving as you might expect it to, it's painful and weight bearing, maybe there is a bit of bruising or swelling with it, maybe there's some night pain, that should make you think, okay, we could be looking at something different here. We might be looking at a bone stress injury. And in particular, I think 
we want to be suspicious in those patients in high risk categories for bone stress injuries. So this tends to be uh, people with risk factors such as low BMI, uh, inadequate nutrition. Uh, it's quite common to see stress fractures in uh, younger athletes. Sometimes adolescent female athletes seem to be a group we see them in, particularly if it's combined with low uh, body mass index and inadequate nutrition as well. Um, if there's been any history of previous stress fracture or of osteopenia or osteoporosis, these are all things that can elevate that risk. So it would elevate that suspicion a bit more. And usually in those people with the risk factors, I'd be more uh, inclined to investigate. Now for the patients that I saw, the aggravated factors for them, yes, they included weight bearing, they included sort of feeling through that heel region, but they also found dorsiflexion painful and calf stretching painful. And I suspect it's because that traction from the Achilles, if it is a quite a superior stress fracture site on the calcaneum, that traction through the Achilles, Achilles would be quite painful because we've got to remember too that muscles place stress on bone. It's not just impact, the muscles can, can impart quite a high stress on the bone too, so that can be part of it. And indeed, in one of these cases, he wasn't able to even do a single calf raise. It just He just wasn't able to do it. I think it just was too uncomfortable trying to use that calf and Achilles to place stress on the calcaneum and actually get him up into a calf raise position. So some of these things do start to fit. But of course, you can imagine... If it's an insertion of Achilles issue, it may also be painful doing a calf raise. So these aren't necessarily going to be barmed or obvious. Now, in terms of your tests, the literature talks about a, a squeeze test. So squeezing the, the, the calcaneus and seeing if it brings on their symptoms with bony palpation. And I would encourage you to do that. Try to be quite thorough in your palpation. Is there pain actually at the Achilles insertion? Is it actually more where the plantar fascia inserts or is there bony tenderness there? Um, if there's bony tenderness, again, with those other features that would raise our level of suspicion. Now a calcaneal stress fracture is considered low risk and that's because the majority can be managed conservatively and unlike our high risk stress fracture sites like the navicular they're less likely to progress on to include complications so you're less likely to see it progress to a full fracture or a vascular necrosis which you can see in the, the navicular for example. So with these low risk ones we we there's a bit of a debate over the value of investigations and which ones to choose so if you suspect a calcaneal stress fracture uh, you could opt for an x-ray but we know they're not very good at spotting stress fractures and sometimes they're only going to see any change two to three weeks after the onset of symptoms so x-ray might be a reasonable first choice but just bear in mind it won't help you rule out a stress fracture uh, ultrasound uh, can actually show up some of the features of a calcaneal stress fracture uh, but again it's going to be um, not 100 percent it's not the most sensitive and specific and it depends on the skills of the sonographer ct may also be an option but generally the gold standard would be an mri now this is where you get a little bit of uh, debate around these low stress, uh, low risk stress fractures, um, or as to whether an MRI is useful. Now, because they're low risk and they're not likely to progress, there is a school of thought that you can manage them based on symptoms and largely based on pain with activity. However, it starts to get a bit more complicated with this because. Uh, some of the recommended management for a calcaneal stress fracture is to be put in a, an air cast or cam boot for four to eight weeks and to potentially be non-weight bearing. Now, personally, I wouldn't want to make that call when we don't necessarily know it's a stress fracture because putting someone non-weight bearing for that period of time is gonna have lots of implications for their strength and for their flexibility, uh, and it's probably gonna mean a, a lengthier period of time coming back into their sport. And this is where, you know, we might have research recommendations, but where we get some gray areas. Also, if we're working with someone who has a key race coming up, 
and they want to feel confident that they can progress and train for that race, it's difficult for them to do that if there's a suspicion of a stress fracture. And we know that stress fracture management is different from, say, tendinopathy management. With tendinopathy, we can work with a, an amount of pain. So that we can often say, yes, it's okay to have some pain during activity if it's mild, if it settles quickly, if you're progressing over time, which may mean that that person can continue a level of training. However, with bone stress injuries and stress fractures, the general consensus is that it's best not to work through pain. And I think that mirrors my clinical experience too. If we get people with bone stress injuries and stress fractures to continue to load in pain, it just seems to delay their recovery. Recovery. So I think there can be times where actually, although it's a low risk stress fracture, um, to guide management and to give us an understanding of prognosis, it can be useful to arrange a, an MRI. And then from there, um, you can make decisions about weight bearing status. We can, we can get a grading from the MRI, which might give us an idea of prognosis with those lower grade stress fractures uh, tending to be associated with more rapid return to sport than the higher grade. So in this situation, what I'm tending to do, as I said, I'm far from an expert in calcaneal stress fractures. Um, I'm tending to refer on to our orthopedic colleagues. Let's get their expert opinion. Let's see if they feel that investigation is going to be useful in this particular case. And then they can help us interpret those investigations they choose to get. And they, they can make good decisions about altering things like weight bearing status or the use of a boot for this particular patient. And that's one thing I'd like you to take away from this uh, if you're you know, listening to what we're talking about. Don't always feel that all the decisions about a patient need to rest on your shoulders. We cannot possibly be experts in absolutely everything. We have wonderful jobs where we can see a huge variety of different people and different presentations, and we can't know everything about every single one of those situations. So sometimes the best thing to do is say, okay, let's get an expert opinion on this. Let's refer to uh, an orthopod who can actually assess this in a little bit more detail and guide us with this. So that's what I would tend to do if you come across a, a stress fracture particularly if you're not familiar with it or if it's a more complex presentation team up uh, to get the best results with your patients okay so in terms of management it might be that one of the first steps is to re refer into orthopedics or to refer to a colleague that's seen these more often um, and then to consider whether investigation is going to be useful um, from reading um, Italiano and Bitterman's work they suggest particularly in those cases if symptoms have not resolved within about six weeks if there's still weight-bearing pain there can be then um, some useful for referring off to for an MRI perhaps in less severe cases that are progressing as you'd expected or getting less problems with weight bearing it may be more appropriate to to treat it based on symptoms it might be that you would want to use a cam or air cast boot for four to eight weeks perhaps to reduce to partial weight bearing or non-weight bearing in those more uh, severe and irritable cases or those with the with risk factors we've talked about and we would hope, and again, there's different views on this, that we're able to return to full activity at around about the 12 week stage. Now, this is going to be highly variable with stress fractures, in my experience. In people with a previous history of stress fractures with existing risk factors, such as low BMI, as we've discussed, they often need a more gradual return to sport. And unfortunately, if they rush back into sport without addressing some of the causes of the stress fracture, we can see secondary injuries. We can see, unfortunately, additional stress fractures develop. So that return to sport needs to be individualized and that treatment needs to be individualized. So once if they've been immobilized, they've been in a boot for a while, once they're out of that, let's assess them thoroughly and see what needs to be addressed. How is their strength? How is their control? How is their flexibility around the foot and ankle? Let's see if we can restore those things. Or what's their, uh, you know, their pain and irritability like? Um, making sure we're listening to that and gradually bringing them back into impact and back into running based on that.
Remembering, of course, the calf and Achilles is going to impart stress on the calcaneum. So we may want to think about carefully and gradually increasing our calf loading work. Um, and again, trying to make sure that it's as symptom free uh, as possible, particularly in those early stages. And then as we bring them back into running, think about building that training volume typically first and then starting to build in intensity, adding in hills and things and other types of training that are going to stress that uh, calcaneum uh, a little bit more. So we've got to try and sort of think about bringing people back in in a sensible way. And as ever with bone stress injuries, thinking about the bigger picture. Uh, there is evidence that stress levels and sleep can affect bone health. We know that obviously diet, past medical history, medications, all sorts of things will influence the bone's ability to adapt uh, and how quickly someone recovers from stress fractures. And for me, this is another reason why a multidisciplinary team approach can be warranted, particularly in the more complex cases as people come back, um, especially if they've had those previous injuries. Okay, so that's a few thoughts on uh, calcaneal stress fractures, uh, how they may present, uh, treatment options uh, that would be available. As I said, I'll leave a, um, a link to that uh, recent review paper from Italiano and Bitterman. Um, if you'd like to learn more about running injuries, do check out our free webinars that I've linked to as well. And I'd like to hear from you, perhaps if you've had a calcaneal stress fracture, um, how's, it, how's it affected you? How quickly did it, uh, were you able to get back into your sport? If you've seen them in clinic, what have you found has worked? Have you had cases where you've not offloaded them in a boot and actually they've done really well? Or perhaps other cases where you've had complications? So I'd really like to hear from you in the comments and replies uh, about what you found with this and uh, look forward to, to hearing more from, from you on this topic. Okay, thanks again for listening. Bye for now.